Uh, today's lecture will be about uh, DC motors. Uh, this is a quite large topic, so uh, we will spend uh, two lectures on it. Uh, and uh, the reason why we will start with DC motors is uh, very simple. It's uh, quite easy to understand uh, the principle of the DC motor. And uh, we will see later that uh, very similar principles apply also for the other machines, uh, the induction motor and the, the synchronous motor, as we will discuss later. Uh, so let me start uh, with uh, the construction of uh, the DC motor. Uh, on this animation, you can see the basic uh, components uh, of a DC motor that are uh, required uh, to make it work. Uh, the main component uh, is uh, the stator magnet. Here uh, you can see that it forms um, a cylinder around the rotor and uh, the stator magnet is creating the magnetic field. Uh, in a DC motor we can have two versions. Uh, one uh, will be shown and is shown on this animation that's uh, where you have a stator magnet so this is really a permanent magnet and it's creating a magnetic field. The second uh, version is uh, where this is not a permanent magnet, but uh, this uh, is a coil, this is a called field winding, and uh, in this field winding uh, we can create also the magnetic flux. Uh, the principle is the same, the construction is a little bit different, uh, we'll see that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, then the second component is uh, the rotor here shown as rotor coils and uh, the rotor coils uh, create uh, the torque that is then transferred uh, on the shaft so uh, on the rotor we have the shaft uh, we have the rotor coils and uh, the rotor coils are connected to a device that is called a commutator uh, we'll see that uh, again in a few minutes uh, what is the function of this commutator and uh, then uh, on the stator we have another component that is the brush and this brush uh, serves uh, to collect the current from the stator and uh, to connect it to the rotor to the rotating part of the electric machine uh, the other components uh, are not really required uh, those uh, components that you see on screen are required to make it work of course, uh, in order to make it work properly, you need other components such as B-rings, uh, casing, cooling and so on. But uh, only those components, as you see on screen, are the most essential ones. Uh, let's take a look uh, on uh, um, some real examples of uh, the DC motor. So on the left picture, uh, you can actually see uh, what is uh, the composition of the rotor? Mm, this is a cutaway view, so uh, it it, ha it was a rotor that we have cut in half, and uh, here uh, you can see its components. So uh, here, uh, this material that I'm showing you right now, this part, uh, this is the rotor iron. Uh, the rotor iron has to be made from a laminated electrical steel. So it's made from thin metallic plates, iron with silicon uh, alloy, and uh, it cannot be made from a single piece of material. We'll see uh, also why this is. And here uh, you can see those wires, uh, those wires form the coils that are wound on the rotor. So a DC motor has uh, a wound rotor and uh, all the current that is going into the motor is uh, going through those coils so uh, if you have a very large motor this rotor current can be very large as well uh, the state uh, the rotor winding is placed in slots so uh, here you can see this uh, shape of uh, the electric steel it has a cut uh, here the hole that is being cut and uh, there is uh, the, the winding that is placed uh, in the rotor slot. 
uh, the material that you see uh, between the iron and the copper uh, this material here uh, this is electrical insulation it is necessary that uh, the copper winding is electrically insulated uh, from the iron in the road and the current then flows uh, in uh, the copper winding uh, the rotor winding is then connected to a commutator here and we'll see in a minute how this is done uh, on the right fig figure you can see the composition of uh, the stator for the DC motor uh, in this example we can see uh, an example with four poles so uh, this is a pole so in this case uh, this is a DC motor with a field winding it's not with the permanent magnets and uh, the goal uh, the purpose of this field winding is to create a magnetic field uh, you can have uh, more poles uh, than just four or than just two uh, it depends on the pa parameters that uh, we require for the motor especially on the speed of the motor that we want and uh, you can see here that uh, it is typically created also uh, as a laminated steel so the stator is laminated steel uh, but here the reason is uh, that uh, it's uh, while you are manufacturing the rotor uh, you can manufacture the stator at the same time uh, but uh, in principle uh, for the DC motor the magnetic circuit in the stator can be also solid iron uh, the reason is simple in uh, the rotor we have an AC current and the AC magnetic flux so uh, we want to limit the losses in the iron material but uh, in the stator that is here the magnetic flux is constant uh, this is uh, also visible here if it's a permanent magnet then the uh, magnetic field is not changing and it has a constant amplitude so uh, in both in this case uh, the field uh, in the stator has a constant magnetic flux so uh, we don't have uh, any current losses uh, or hysteresis losses so uh, it can be made from solid iron uh, here you can see the number of poles uh, in this case it's four and uh, we can see here the stator winding and uh, the stator winding uh, in this case uh, is used to uh, create the magnetic flux uh, so we have DC current that is flowing through this field winding uh, compared to the rotor field rotor winding the current that flows in the stator winding is uh, much smaller uh, so the main current for the DC motor flows through the rotor it has to go through through the commutator and through the brushes uh, and uh, here this uh, we will call that excitation current or field current field in the field winding uh, is uh, only a small portion of it of the total mo current that you have in the motor uh, here are a few examples of the rotor uh, the rotor is also sometimes called armature uh, and uh, it is directly mounted uh, on the shaft so here uh, we can see the winding on the rotor uh, this is placed in the slots you can see m many versions a uh, little bit different construction but uh, in principle they all do the same thing uh, always uh, the winding is placed in slots we can see how the uh, coil is made so for example this one uh, all the wires go like this in uh, the slot then uh, the uh, wire is going on the back side and then it's going back and uh, the way it's connected is that the first wire is going from the section of the commutator it's going uh, to the slot and then there are several turns made like this and uh, when the slot is full then it's going back to another section of the commutator uh, which is on the opposite side so for example if uh, here on top i would have one section uh, of the coil then here i would have the second section here on the bottom so the coil is connected always in such a way that uh, uh, it's a uh, one terminal is here and another terminal is here if uh, you have just two brushes in uh, the dc motor uh, 
uh, on the photos we can also see that uh, the uh, rotor iron is really made from laminated steel so here you can see the lamination so this is the thin sheets of uh, electrical steel uh, the thickness uh, is, is, is various but uh, something like uh, smaller than one millimeter uh, when we have discussed the materials, we've seen that it's, for example, 0 0.35 millimeters. Uh, thickness is the, one of the most common electrical steels. Uh, you can see here that it can be something smaller. Uh, since uh, in the rotor winding uh, we have uh, AC magnetic flux, uh, it means that uh, we need to minimize the losses. Uh, in principle, again, it would work if uh, you make it from solid piece of iron but uh, you would have a very large uh, losses in uh, the magnetics circuit uh, you can also see on uh, this picture B that uh, in some cases uh, there is a angle between the axis of the shaft here and uh, between the axis of the slots uh, it's not for all electrical machines for example here you can see that uh, it has the same direction. Uh, the reason why uh, this is uh, skewed uh, is uh, that uh, uh, if you s use this angle, if you use this skew angle, then uh, it uh, will give you better performance in torque. In other words, uh, there will be less torque ripple uh, in the machine. Uh, you can see that uh, the machine can be either placed on a shaft like this, uh, then of course, obviously here there would be some bearings and uh, it would be placed in the stator uh, and uh, here you would use uh, a coupling and uh, through coupling you would connect it to the load the load could be a fan, it could be a drill, it could be, it could be any machine that you need to use now in some cases uh, it is uh, directly connected to the appliance so for example here uh, this is an example where you have a DC motor and uh, this looks like a worm gear. So uh, here there will be a gearbox uh, placed in this position. It's uh, very typical to have uh, gearboxes for, the, for those motors. If you want to reduce uh, speed and increase torque then uh, you can have uh, it directly on the shaft. So uh, the load, the appliance would then be connected here. Uh, there will be uh, this is the worm, worm and this would there will be the gear and uh, this would be the, the gearbox itself uh, so this is the rotor or the armature of uh, the DC machine uh, here uh, you have a picture of the laminations uh, for the rotor uh, so uh, you can see the laminated steel uh, when it is uh, manufactured uh, it is uh, done on a press typically or uh, cut with a laser today and uh, uh, these uh, sheets are then stacked in this stack and uh, they, are, they are aligned uh, they are fixed uh, so that uh, they hold the shape that you see like that and uh, then they are wound uh, either manually or with some uh, coil winding machines uh, that will place the coils in uh, the slot so then uh, for example if you have a coil it could go like this uh, here you would have the the winding and it would it would go to some slot uh, it actually depends on the parameters it could go uh, all the way to the slot that you see here to the next slot or it, it could go to some other slots uh, based on the speed uh, and torque requirements uh, this is the commutator uh, the commutator in the DC motor or DC machine uh, acts uh, like a mechanical rectifier. Uh, we'll see the function in a minute. Uh, I will be talking uh, about DC machines. Not uh, I will try not to limit this only to DC motors, because exactly the same construction is uh, done also uh, for uh, DC generators. So in this case, uh, it's the same machine, only the direction of power is different. Uh, so uh, this is how the commutator looks like. It's uh, a copper cylinder that you see in here. 
and uh, this copper cylinder has uh, insulated sections. So uh, here this section is electrically insulated from this section, from this section and so on. And uh, then uh, this part of the commutator that you see over there uh, serves uh, to connect the coils uh, from the rotor windings. So uh, then the wires are soldered here uh, to this uh, slots uh, with solder and uh, they connect electrically uh, the uh, commutator to the rotor winding. Um, I will later show you a video how uh, this uh, DC motor is uh, produced and also about the applications. Uh, this is a, a picture of the stator uh, of such electrical machine. Again, uh, this is a four pole DC motor. On, so, so here we can see four poles, but uh, other versions are available as well. And uh, this is uh, the rotor, this is the stator piece. So in this case, it's solid iron. And uh, here, this is the so-called pole piece. And uh, this is the field winding. So this is an inductor and uh, it's uh, creating the magnetic flux. Uh, in this four pole uh, version, uh, you power that with uh, DC voltage. Uh, all the coils are connected either in series or in parallel and they are creating uh, a constant uh, magnetic flux. Uh, so uh, in uh, the explanation that I will uh, show you in a few minutes, uh, you will see that uh, we are neglecting for the explanation the stator of uh, the DC machine. But uh, in reality, uh, the stator is there and uh, we need to make sure that the magnetic flux is closed. So uh, this is uh, an explanation here. Uh, this is the stator and uh, here with the red curves I have highlighted the direction of the magnetic flux. So the magnetic flux is uh, created by the field winding that you see over there. And uh, you can see that uh, all the coils are connected in series. So uh, we have uh, here those two terminals. Those two terminals uh, are used uh, to uh, connect uh, the power supply to it will be the DC voltage. And uh, here you can see also how those coils are oriented. So that here this pole creates as a north pole. Here we have south pole, north pole and south pole. So in this uh, arrangement uh, the motor uh, has four magnetic poles. If uh, that would be a, a motor with uh, for example just two poles, let's say uh, this pole and this pole, then uh, we would not have this pole and that pole and uh, this would be uh, for example south pole and this would be north pole. So we, we will always have the same number as south poles uh, as uh, north poles. Uh, the magnetic flux uh, is created by the field windings that we have here and uh, it needs to be guided uh, through the ferromagnetic material. So uh, in the middle here we have the rotor. So uh, here we have the ferromagnetic material because uh, the rotor is this and uh, here uh, the magnetic flux goes through this uh, electrical steel and it's being closed uh, back to the rotor. Uh, copper itself is not ferromagnetic so uh, here uh, the magnetic flux is going through this uh, silicon steel but not through this copper winding so uh, it's uh, being closed uh, by the iron. So here we have the ferromagnetic material. Uh, of course there is an air gap uh, between the stator and between the rotor uh, the air gap uh, ideally uh, would be very small, uh, the smaller the better in terms of magnetic flux, but uh, in terms of uh, mechanical properties uh, uh, we have some limitations. So uh, typically 
at the air gap we when we build such a motor uh, we try to keep it as small as possible but on the other hand uh, you want to avoid the fact that the rotor may hit the stator so you need some uh, air gap between the stator and the rotor uh, the normal size of the air gap is something under one millimeter again as if if, if uh, possible then uh, it should be made very small but uh, due to vibrations uh, due to tolerances uh, due to uh, forces in the rotor uh, we need to keep some air gap there uh, if you make the air gap very small then you risk the problem uh, with uh, the collision between the rotor and the stator uh, when you have vibrations uh, or uh, even uh, with thermal expansion of the material if you are heating up the machine it will expand and uh, it can hit uh, uh, the, the rotor between the stator which will obviously damage or destroy the, the machine so mechanically we are constrained with uh, some very small air gap uh, let's say under one millimeter uh, but uh, this will deteriorate the properties of uh, the magnetic circuit uh, we have seen uh, i think uh, a few weeks ago uh, when we have discussed magnetic circuits that uh, the presence of an air gap in a circuit uh, will dramatically increase the magnetic resistance and uh, that it's very important to minimize the air gap that you have actually in your device. So keep in mind that uh, we are trying to guide all the magnetic flux through iron if possible. So here we have the rotor, here this is the pole piece again iron and the frame here is again iron. Uh, in some cases it can be one piece uh, where you have the frame plus the pole piece uh, due to assembly reasons, it's uh, typically done as several pieces that are assembled together. So uh, you have a cylinder, that's your frame. And uh, then you have an individual piece with the inductor. And uh, then it's assembled, it's, it's mounted together with, uh, it, with screws, for example. Uh, so now uh, let's see how uh, this uh, DC motor works. So what is the principle? Of uh, the electric machine. Uh, the principle will be common to all electric machines. So regardless if it's a DC motor or if it's an AC motor, it will always use the same principle. And the principle is very simple. Uh, if uh, we have uh, an electric current uh, in a conductor, in a wire, and we place this in a, a magnetic field, then we will get a force. So uh, this is the magnetic field that is in the, in my case it's oriented uh, in this direction from the north pole to south pole. Uh, here I have the current that I have in the wire and then here we will have uh, the force that is being created. Uh, the force uh, is a vector multiplication of uh, the magnetic field that you see here B times current times uh, length so uh, if you make the machine longer uh, you will create a larger force and hence larger torque uh, on the other hand if your machine will be short then uh, it will create less torque than a longer machine uh, with uh, similar diameters and uh, magnetic fields so in this picture uh, I have uh, chosen this as a permanent magnet and this is a permanent magnet as well uh, it could be very easily uh, the field windings as well and uh, please note that uh, in this picture in order to make it simple there is no closed magnetic circuit so uh, i'm not showing any iron in the circuit but uh, in order to make it work properly uh, we would need an iron stator here around it to conduct the magnetic flux and the same here in the rotor we need again uh, the magnetic flux uh, to be conducted by the iron so in fact it would look like this uh, this would be the magnetic uh, the, the magnets and here there would be this uh, cylinder and in the middle uh, here we would have those laminations 
but since this picture would be very complicated uh, I have chosen to remove uh, this uh, from the pictures so this is my conductor this is my coil uh, that's uh, what is in the rotor uh, here it is shown as a single turn but uh, again we've seen in the pictures that uh, uh, we have uh, more than one turn uh, the number of turns uh, gives you uh, if you increase the number of turns uh, it will give you the uh, larger torque uh, but uh, but also uh, you will have uh, more space uh, consumed in the rotor so uh, you can create a larger motor with larger torque but it will be mechanically larger uh, here uh, this uh, is the commutator and uh, you can see that now it is uh, connecting uh, the uh, wire from the rotor winding to the brush which is shown here in uh, gray and uh, here we have the power supply uh, that is powering the DC motor. Uh, since uh, this is a permanent magnet motor uh, this uh, is the permanent magnet and uh, we don't have any field winding but uh, those permanent magnets here north and south could uh, very easily be replaced with the field winding uh, we'll see uh, also today or next week maybe uh, what are the properties of permanent magnet machines and machines with field windings uh, you can note here that uh, this part of uh, the wire has uh, the current going in this direction and uh, since this is a vector multiplication uh, we can easily calculate that uh, the force will have this direction so uh, from this current with this magnetic field the force will go up uh, here the current is flowing and uh, it's going back through this uh, conductor and uh, here we can easily find out that the force uh, will have this direction so it will go from top to bottom uh, since uh, the magnetic field is the same and the current is the same uh, we will have the same size of uh, force here and here uh, this force and this force uh, will create us a torque and uh, this rotor will start to move so it will move uh, in this direction it will move upwards and this here it will mo move uh, downwards uh, there is no torque uh, created in this part of the wire uh, because uh, the wire uh, runs along uh, this magnetic field so uh, this part does not create any torque and this part is not creating any torque it is uh, parallel to the direction of the magnetic field so now we have a force and uh, therefore the uh, rotor will start to rotate so as I've already said this will go up and this will go down uh, let's take a look on uh, the second position so let's say uh, this is now the situation and the uh, rotor has rotated by some angle theta here uh, the brushes uh, stay the same the permanent magnets stay the same because they are on the stator but uh, the coil has rotated and here the commutator has rotated as well now uh, the uh, force uh, that we creating here is uh, still perpendicular to the magnetic field here that uh, from this equation uh, we can find out that the force will always be perpendicular to the current and to the magnetic field so here we have this force but uh, now uh, we have an angle and uh, the force that will actually act on the rotor uh, will be a little bit smaller than uh, in the first case and uh, here it will be uh, force uh, which is a constant value times uh, cosine of the angle theta so when angle theta is zero as uh, was shown in this example then we had a maximum force uh, when uh, we have some angle the force is slowly decreasing uh, so now we keep rotating the rotor and uh, we arrive at this position at this position 
uh, here we have angle theta 90 degrees. Uh, there is still the magnetic field, there is still current in uh, the uh, rotor. Uh, well, so far, but in a minute we'll see that it's, it's not there. But uh, here we will see that uh, if I apply this equation, then if theta is 90 degrees, then force is zero. So in this position, actually, the rotor would stop. So it would not continue with the motion because this force is zero. Uh, another reason why uh, we will have zero torque is in this position, it's shown here. Here you can see that those sections of the commutator are now short circuiting the, the brushes. So here is the power supply and the power supply has now a short connection between this brush through this segment to the brush and also through this segment as well. So this is a very simple case, but uh, we can see that uh, there would not be any force created for those two reasons. First of all, we have 90 degrees and then here we have no current. So in the real motor, uh, we need to have more sections on the commutator than just one. So uh, here we will have more coils. And also we will have more sections on the commutator so that this will not happen. Uh, another reason why the DC motor will not stop at this position is uh, inertia. So uh, if we already have some rotation here, uh, we will uh, be able to overcome this uh, position, this 90 degrees, and uh, the rotor will still rotate. Anyway, if uh, we have only a limited number of sections here in the coils and on the commutator, uh, it's clear that we will have some torque ripple. In other words, uh, if you look uh, on the torque as a function of uh, this angle theta, it will not give you a constant torque, but uh, obviously in this position the torque will be smaller and uh, it will be the maximum torque it is available when it's this in this position. So uh, when your coil is aligned in this position, you, it creates a maximum torque. Uh, when uh, we are rotating it, uh, the torque is uh, increasing. So it's a cosine dependence. Uh, anyway, when we have already overcome this position, uh, we again start having some torque. In this position, we can see that uh, we have current again and uh, here the commutator is not short circuiting the brushes so current can flow and uh, we start having uh, the force again. Now if you compare this picture now in this uh, this uh, section of uh, the commutator now at this moment it was connected to the positive terminal of the power supply so here we had a current that is going like this. Uh, and uh, when I continue with that, now this was this section. And now uh, you can see that uh, this section is now suddenly connected to the negative terminal. And here we have the positive terminal. Uh, this means that uh, we have actually reversed the direction of current here. In this... Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah, so, so here uh, we still are creating the force in this direction of the current and this creates the force. So in this case, uh, we uh, are sure that uh, the force is still acting in the same direction. If we would not have the commutator, if this would be, for example, just a simple ring with, uh, with brushes, then uh, the current uh, will change direction and uh, uh, we will have a different direction of the force. So the motor uh, would go like this, it would end at this position and then the force will would uh, reverse the direction and the motor would, would spin back or it would stand still at this position. So we, we can see that uh, right now uh, we can continue with the acceleration of the motor uh, in this uh, direction. Uh, so this is how the motor works. 
Uh, let's see in a little bit more detail uh, what the other components uh, we have uh, in such a, a DC mode. So here uh, we have uh, the rotor, other words uh, also called the armature. Uh, here uh, we see the commutator. You see it has many sections that are actually mounted on the, on the rotor. And uh, here we have the brushes. Uh, the brushes uh, will connect the current from the stator into the rotor and into the rotor winding. Uh, obviously we need some bearings, so here we have a bearing and there will be another bearing at the other end of the motor. Uh, we have a shaft uh, and here uh, you would connect a coupling and uh, you will connect uh, the load, would be any, any, any machine. And uh, this is the stator case, so in this stator case uh, this uh, would be the field winding. Now uh, there would be another field winding at the other end, so this looks like the field winding. And uh, typically it's uh, assembled that th this is like a cylinder, and here we have one end bracket and another end bracket uh, that uh, is holding the actual bearings, and this holds all the machine uh, in together. Uh, the machine then needs cooling, so uh, you have individual openings here and. Uh, here those are those ribs uh, are to provide the airflow and to, to cool down the electric machine uh, here you have a few examples of uh, large uh, dc motors so this is a 1.3 megawatt electric motor you can see about the size uh, the dc motors are still used in the industry uh, but it's true that uh, there are being more and more replaced uh, with uh, induction motors and uh, with permanent magnet motors. Uh, the reason is uh, efficiency and they have a smaller efficiency uh, compared to induction motors and uh, to permanent magnet motors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's uh, very easy to control the speed and torque of the DC motor so uh, you don't require uh, an electronic circuit that is too complicated so uh, there are still used uh, in, in both large machines and uh, small machines as well uh, another example um, there is a link here i don't remember the parameters but uh, this looks again like a very large motor uh, the advantage of those uh, large dc motors is that uh, it's uh, very simple to control the parameters and the speed. Uh, the way it's done is that uh, we control the current in the field winding and not the main current. So we are controlling uh, a very small current which can be done with uh, a very simple electrical circuit. Uh, this is uh, an example of a smaller motor during assembly. Uh, so uh, 500 horsepower and uh, you can see how the rotor is being built uh, so again this is the rotor assembly we can see the bearings here and here already mounted on the shaft and uh, here uh, this white stuff this is electrical insulation so it insulates electrically the copper wire from the uh, iron and uh, here you can see that it's this is already assembled inside and here they are still assembling the, the coils uh, in the, the rotor winding so here when they assemble the coil they push all together into the slot and they fix it uh, with uh, with um, a wedge that uh, holds all this in place uh, I will show you uh, today a video as well uh, we can uh, now uh, continue with explanation for the properties of the electric motor so the way it works is uh, that uh, we have uh, one magnetic field this is this main magnetic field here you can see that uh, it's been created by the stator by the field winding now in this example it's uh, the, with two poles and uh, in the ideal case it would have this uniform magnetic field so there, there is a completely uniform magnetic field uh, created by the state uh, in the rotor uh, we have uh, wires with electric current 
so this is shown here and uh, the current is now flowing uh, in the winding so we can see that here uh, it flows in one direction and here it flows back uh, and uh, we can see that this current will create its own magnetic flux as well so we now have uh, two magnetic fields one from the stator and uh, one from the rotor now obviously the two magnetic fields will interact together so this is then the situation shown here in this uh, picture on the bottom uh, where we can see that uh, the two fields interact in such a way that uh, it deforms the main magnetic field from the stator like this and uh, this means that uh, we need to shift uh, the it's called the neutral axis here you can see uh, the the neutral axis and the neutral axis means that uh, you have such a position when the induced voltage in the rotor is zero uh, in other words if i would go back to my animation here then this would be the ideal position uh, when uh, you have 90 degrees uh, you have uh, zero induced voltage in there but uh, due to the armature reaction uh, we need to shift it slightly so it will not be 90 degrees but a uh, few degrees more or less so this is uh, what uh, this picture is saying so in this case you can see here that ideally if the two fields would not interact then uh, it would be uh, it would be this angle 90 degrees but here we need to uh, shift the neutral axis angle because uh, the main field is disrupted, disrupted uh, by the armature magnetic field. Uh, let's take a look on uh, the magnetic fields uh, as a function of uh, position. So if you take the rotor, if you take this picture for example, and if I start at one position and uh, then I will go along uh, the uh, rotor here like this, uh, th then I can plot the dependence of this magnetic flux on position uh, and uh, that's what you see here on this picture so here uh, we can see this is the pole of the stator north and south pole so again this would be the uh, case uh, when you have uh, the two pole DC motor uh, we can see here the wires of the field winding so this uh, winding creates uh, the magnetic flux and this uh, creates the magnetic flux as well the two uh, co inductors are connected in series uh, and again this is a uh, ferromagnetic material uh, here we can see the air gap and uh, here this is the rotor and uh, here we can see the wires uh, of the rotor winding uh, so uh, there is current in them so here we see positive current and here we see negative current uh, and uh, through the air gap uh, all this is connected with the brush so the main current in the DC motor flows uh, from the power supply into the brush through the rotor winding and back through another brush uh, to the power supply uh, and you can see here uh, that this is the flux uh, density distribution that uh, is uh, created only by the main field so uh, when we are under the uh, pole here uh, we have a constant magnetic flux so this is a constant value uh, here we have one polarity here we have another polarity and uh, we need a transition between uh, one polarity and, a, and another so uh, it, uh, this is the transition region so here we are not under the pole but uh, we have this transiting region so this is how it would look like only if uh, you don't have any current in the rotor so if this rotor current is zero uh, this can be measured for example you rotate manually the rotor and uh, you measure the strength of magnetic field so this is uh, the shape that you would exactly get uh, now uh, we have one current in uh, the rotor winding that's that's here and uh, at this position 
uh, we have an interaction between the stator magnetic field and the rotor magnetic field. So this is uh, the interaction uh, that you can see in this picture. Uh, so we can see that uh, there, there will be uh, an, an uh, distortion of the magnetic field. So it will look like this. So without the magnetic field, the zero transition of the magnetic field from the stator was here at this position or here at that position. Uh, but uh, since uh, we have this interaction between rotor and stator, it means that uh, w this uh, point where uh, the resultant magnetic flux is zero has shifted by some angle. Uh, thing actually in this picture it should be from here to there. So this should be the, the shift in the, in the angle. So uh, we need to orient a little bit differently the, the stator. Uh, the way it's done in real electric machines is that uh, the brushes can be rotated slightly. So then you move this brush in order to uh, achieve the zero induced voltage when this is uh, connecting the two sections together. So this is the co called armature reaction. Uh, this is how uh, we can uh, neutralize the effect of armature reaction. So uh, one way is uh, that uh, we have the brushes that actually can be rotated. Uh, another way is that uh, we create, a, let's say, an auxiliary, auxiliary magnetic field uh, that will suppress uh, this uh, effects uh, of the magnetic field interaction. So then we have uh, the main magnetic pole here. This is what is creating the magnetic flux. And we have uh, a so-called interpole that is smaller. Uh, it is uh, under this angle 90 degrees and uh, it's helping with the armature reaction. Okay, so now let's take a look uh, on uh, the powers that uh, we actually have uh, in the motor. Now this uh, power flow diagram can be shown not only for DC motors, but it can work for AC motors, it can work for transformers, for example. Uh, so for a DC motor, if it's acting like a motor, uh, the input is uh, electric energy. And uh, since uh, we are in a DC circuit, the input power is uh, voltage times current. And the output power, here this is mechanical power, and uh, the output power is that's what we have on the shaft, and uh, it's uh, torque times angular speed. So uh, we are transferring the electrical power that we have on the input to the mechanical power that we have uh, in the output. Now this first component in the power flow diagram is uh, the stator loss. Uh, sorry, rotor loss. Uh, because here uh, we are for DC motor we are conducting all the current through the brushes into the rotor and uh, this R is the resistance of uh, the rotor winding and uh, we can see that this is proportional to I squared so if we double the uh, current in the motor uh, we quadruple the rotor core uh, rotor copper losses uh, then uh, if we subtract those losses in the winding uh, then we have uh, here uh, all the power that is uh, being transferred through the air gap and this goes like a magnetic field into the into the stator and from and the rotor and uh, here uh, we have the core losses uh, this is the loss in the magnetic uh, circuit uh, of the rotor and of the stator as well. Uh, we obviously have some mechanical losses. Uh, this uh, would be uh, losses in the B-rings. Uh, if we have some cooling fan uh, that cools the motor down and so on. And uh, here uh, those trail losses is something that we cannot easily describe. So. Uh, we take this as a percentage of the total power. 
The stray losses uh, can, for example, represent the uh, stray magnetic flux uh, that uh, is not uh, flowing in the iron, but it's flowing in the air. But uh, anyway, these uh, stray losses are quite small compared to the other losses that uh, we have uh, in the machine. Uh, this diagram uh, is in this form is exactly the same also for an induction motor. Um, we will have some additional components uh, of the losses, but basically in all electric machines you have some mechanical losses, you have some core losses and you have some copper losses. And the ratio of those losses depends on the construction of the machine, it depends on the materials and uh, it also depends uh, whether it's a, a DC motor or if it's an induction motor. But all components are there, it's just a question of the ratio between those losses. Uh, now uh, let's take a look on circuits uh, that uh, can be used uh, with DC motors. Uh, in a DC motor we have basically four terminals. Now uh, two terminals shown here are used uh, to power the field winding. So if it's a, a DC motor with field winding this is uh, uh, where you connect the current and uh, this field winding then creates the magnetic flux. So here if I go back uh, to the picture that we have here then this would be the field winding and this would be the field winding as well and uh, it would be powered from a power supply. Now the second uh, com that we need to connect is uh, the rotor and uh, here you can see that the rotor is connected uh, through the brushes here this uh, black black rectangle represents the brush and this is the brush as well and the main current is flowing through the armature again uh, back to the power supply uh, there are several options how this could be connected as it's shown here, uh, we have separate power supply for the field winding that we have here and another power supply that uh, supplies here the main current. So uh, this would be called with a configuration with a separate excitation. So here this field winding has a separate power supply and there is no connection between this power supply and that power supply only they are interacting with the magnetic fields from this winding and from this uh, from this uh, rotor winding. Uh, here are the possibilities that we actually have how we can connect the DC mode. So here uh, we have uh, what I've just explained the separate excitation. So here we have one DC power supply for the field winding and here we have uh, one power supply for the armature winding. Uh, this is used quite a lot. Uh, it has uh, many advantages, especially uh, if you want to create uh, a motor with a very simple speed control. Uh, the second possibility is shown here, case B. Uh, you can see that the field winding is uh, now connected in series uh, with uh, the main winding. So uh, there is just one power supply over here on those two terminals and uh, we can see that the, all the current is flowing through the field winding and uh, through the armature winding and back to the power supply. Again this is uh, used quite a lot because this allows us uh, to create uh, a machine that has a very suitable uh, torque speed characteristic for traction application. So if it, that would be an electric motorcycle or an electric car then a connection like this or a simulation of connection like this uh, will provide us very suitable properties for the electric vehicle in general. Uh, you can see here case C that's called a shunt possibility or shunt connection. In this case we still have one power supply this as here on those two terminals but uh, one part of the current goes through that armature winding here so through the rotor 
and here we have the field winding and uh, it is powered with the same uh, power supply so we have the same voltage here and the same voltage for the field winding uh, here with this field uh, rail start or it's a, it's a variable resistor uh, we can actually control the current that flows uh, here through this shunt, uh, to this field winding and uh, we can uh, actually control the amount of current flowing through this winding and this gives us a very easy control about uh, the properties of the electric motor and uh, the last case, case D here, it's not that common but uh, it basically combines uh, cases B and C uh, so we have uh, series winding so this winding creates a part of magnetic flux and uh, then another part of the magnetic flux is created here so this combines the properties of the series motor with this uh, shunt uh, configuration so as I said all options are used uh, this is a little bit less common the, the most common ones are either this one or this one or this one though A cases A, B, C and we'll see uh, the properties uh, of those connections uh, so now uh, let's see uh, how can we actually uh, describe mathematically uh, the electric motor uh, we will use a very similar approach as uh, we've already used for transformers uh, we will create an equivalent circuit diagram. Uh, so uh, we will use electrical symbols such as uh, inductors, uh, resistors and voltage supplies to create this equivalent circuit diagram. Uh, let me stress out that uh, this equivalent circuit diagram has nothing in common with the mechanical function of the DC motor. So uh, this is an electrical schematic and uh, if you connect uh, inductors and resistors like that it will not be a DC motor. Uh, the goal of this uh, equivalent circuit diagram is uh, to help us in writing the equations and understanding electrically what the motor is doing and what properties does it have. It does not have anything in common with the mechanical function. Now uh, what you see here on screen is the equivalent circuit diagram for the separately excited motor. So that's the case when we have one power supply for the field winding and uh, we have another power supply for the armature winding. Uh, I will call this VB for the field winding and all the here the, the letters here in this description uh, will be B for the field winding and uh, the armature will have the letter A. Uh, the interaction between the two circuits is done uh, with the magnetic field. As you can see here, uh, this is the magnetic flux. Uh, now, if we describe this circuit, uh, we can describe that with a differential equation. Uh, so here, uh, if uh, I have uh, a voltage VB from the field on the field winding, then the voltage uh, on the resistor plus the voltage on the inductor has to be equal to the voltage VB. Uh, since uh, we are describing this uh, as a function of time, uh, it will be given by a differential equation. And we know that uh, for an inductor, the voltage on the inductor is inductance times rate of change of current. So here dB over dt. Uh, this is Ohm's law. R times current. Uh, so this is the differential equation that describes the behavior in uh, also in transient modes. Uh, we can do the same for the armature circuit. So here uh, we have an inductor that represents the inductance of the armature. Uh, here we have the resistance that represents the resistance of the armature. And uh, this uh, symbol uh, VI uh, that actually represents the induced voltage that uh, we have in the winding. And the reason why we have this induced voltage there is that as soon as the rotor starts rotating, uh, it is uh, suddenly uh, a conductor uh, in a magnetic field, so we will have an induced voltage. 
and this induced voltage uh, will interact with this voltage and it will try to oppose the voltage uh, that hit at uh, the voltage VA. So this uh, voltage VA, the induced voltage, uh, will actually be dependent on speed and this will give us uh, complete equations uh, for the speed of the motor as well. You will see that in the on the next slide. Uh, now if we describe this circuit, now uh, again we will do this in the transient mode. So here we have again the voltage on the inductor, LA times DA over DT. And uh, here we have the voltage on the resistor, that's the loss the voltage drop on resistor RA. And uh, for the time being, let's just use this as a symbol VI that will describe as the, the induced voltage in the circuit. So, so far we have the electrical equations for the armature winding and for the field winding. Uh, now, if uh, the motor will not have separate excitation, but it will have some different configuration, uh, we will modify those equations. For example, if uh, this would be the case that we have, uh, we have here, uh, where uh, we have a single power supply for the armature and uh, for the field winding, then uh, this uh, voltage VB would be equal to the voltage VA and uh, those two sections of the circuit would be connected in parallel. Uh, so we have electrical equations. Uh, we now need also the equation for the magnetic circuit. Uh, so this means that we need a dependence between the magnetic flux and uh, the current IB. Uh, and we already know what this dependence is. Uh, this dependence is nothing else than the hysteresis curve. So here we have the current IB, and when I'm increasing the current, I'm uh, increasing the magnetic flux, and uh, here uh, it's moving along the hysteresis curve. Uh, since uh, this is a DC circuit, uh, we sit at one given point uh, that uh, gives us a constant magnetic flux. So here uh, this phi value is a constant value. So this is shown in this equation that phi is some constant times the current IB. And this constant actually depends uh, on the construction of the motor. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a number but it's a constant value. So we have now the equation that relates uh, the two circuits together with this help of uh, the magnetic flux that we have. This will be the third equation that we will need for the circuit. Uh, now uh, something about the induced voltage. Uh, the induced voltage is a function of speed. You can imagine a very simple experiment. You can do it um, very simple at home as well. Uh, if you take uh, a permanent magnet, some source of magnetic field, and uh, you have an inductor and you start moving the inductor with respect to the permanent magnet uh, and to measure the voltage uh, you will get the induced voltage and uh, you will see that uh, the induced voltage is a function of speed so uh, the faster you're moving the inductor then the faster uh, the, the larger will be the induced voltage uh, in other words, uh, the induced voltage is directly proportional to angular speed that we have here. So this is omega is the angular speed. Uh, it is also directly proportional to the magnetic flux. So if uh, I make a larger magnetic flux that I have here in my circuit, then I will obviously get uh, a larger induced voltage. So again, it's directly proportional. And uh, the constant CSS here, uh, this is uh, based on the construction. So this is telling us what is the relation between the uh, speed and magnetic flux to the induced voltage. So again, it's based on the construction, it's based on the materials, but it's a constant value. Uh, next equations that we will actually need are equations for torque. Now in the DC motor, uh, the torque uh, that uh, the motor will create is a function of current and magnetic flux. 
So uh, if uh, we have this circuit like this, then uh, if we increase the armature current, uh, then uh, we will be able to increase the torque. And uh, the same also for the magnetic flux phi here. So uh, there is a direct relation between the torque the machine creates and uh, the, those two variables. Uh, so IA is armature current, phi is uh, magnetic flux. Uh, again, it is dependent on construction of the machine, which will be expressed here by the same constant CSS. Uh, you can note that here the torque, uh, when I'm uh, actually increasing the magnetic flux, then I'm increasing the torque. Uh, for the induced voltage, however, is the same. So if I choose a large magnetic flux, I will have a large induced voltage, but large induced voltage here will go against the voltage VA and uh, I will limit the current. So uh, it's a trade-off between current and uh, amount of induced voltage that you actually have in the motor. Uh, also, uh, if uh, we want to increase the magnetic flux, uh, we need to watch for saturation. So we do not want to go to the hysteresis curve at this area uh, where it is already saturated. So the typical position for electric machines during design is uh, to position it somewhere here at this knee, because here at this knee uh, we have uh, sufficient uh, magnetic flux, but uh, we don't have saturation in the magnetic circuit. So it's, it will be somewhere here in this area. So this is uh, an equation for electrical torque. And uh, the last equation uh, is mechanical equation. Uh, so this it can help us to calculate what is uh, the speed of the motor and what is the torque, for example. Uh, the machine creates some electrical torque and uh, this uh, torque has to be an, in equilibrium uh, with the, the load torque, TL, here. And uh, the, this part of the equation that represents uh, the damping, B, here, and uh, J is the moment of inertia. So uh, if we combine now all those equations together, uh, we can get the complete mathematical description of uh, the electric machine, which is uh, with those equations. So here, uh, this is an equation for the armature winding. Now note that I have already replaced this induced voltage with uh, the flux and angular speed. So here, that's uh, the effect of induced voltage. Uh, here, uh, we have the equation for the field winding. Uh, here is the equation for the magnetic circuit. And uh, here we have the mechanical equation as the differential equation. All those uh, functions are differential equations. Uh, so uh, you can use this uh, universally also for transient effects. But uh, in a minute we will simplify it even further uh, because uh, we will assume that electrically it is in steady state. Uh, and the last equation here is shown the electrical torque. So again, it's a proportional to current and magnetic flux. So now this is a complete mathematical description. We can use this formulas uh, to create calculations or simulations of the behavior of electric machines. Uh, for example, we can calculate torque, we can calculate speed of the motor, we can calculate the behavior here, if we know the behavior of the load, if we know uh, friction and if we know uh, inertia, we can calculate everything with the motor. Now, you can see that here we have a set of uh, three differential equations. So this will be a little bit harder to solve normally, unless uh, we do some numerical simulation. So what we do is uh, that we calculate this in steady state. And uh, we will assume that uh, we have steady state both electrically and mechanically. So electrically, this means that uh, here this current IA is a constant value. And uh, since this is a constant value, then this derivative of current is zero. 
so electrically uh, it will be only here RA times IA plus this and mechanically it will be the same here if I use mechanical steady state it means that in this equation this formula this term is zero so the angular speed is not changing uh, this will obviously not apply during startup or during uh, stop of the motor but it will apply in steady state so again uh, in this equation we will have just this formula here load torque and eventually the friction so this is what you see here uh, so from the electrical equation uh, we can calculate that the angular speed is given by this formula and here we can see this the armature voltage this is what is coming from the power supply minus the voltage drop that we have on the armature resistance and we can see that this voltage drop depends on uh, the resistance times current so if i increase the resistance or the current it uh, will give us a larger voltage drop so uh, the larger this this part it's the, the larger the voltage drop and uh, here uh, we have uh, the magnetic flux and we have a construction of the machine so we can obvious we cannot obviously change this uh, the construction constant but uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, change this magnetic flux so the magnetic flux is changed simply by changing the current in the field winding now uh, obviously we cannot do this for permanent magnet machines so for permanent magnet machines all this is constant and the only way how you can actually change the speed is by changing the armature resistance or the current. Uh, the current has an effect on the torque. So we can see here that uh, here this is the armature current uh, and it's current times flux times the constant. And uh, if I increase here the speed by uh, decreasing magnetic flux, I will decrease the torque as well so there definitely will be a relation between speed and torque uh, for the DC motor and uh, we will call this uh, the uh, torque speed characteristic so now this this uh, is a simplified model uh, that uh, works only in mechanical and electrical steady state but uh, we will use it a lot uh, only if you really need to calculate the transition behavior either mechanically or electrically uh, you will use the complete set of equations uh, but for example during the exam uh, the all the calculations are assuming mechanical and electrical steady state so uh, you will use those equations uh, so now let's take a look uh, on uh, the torque speed characteristic for those two k for some configurations of the motor. Uh, it's uh, relatively simple. Uh, we will make those simplifications. First of all, uh, we will assume mechanical and electrical steady state. And then we will neglect also this component, uh, which is friction. So we will uh, make an ideal DC motor where we don't have any friction. So this component here. Uh, will be zero as well and uh, then we have only two equations that will apply that you can see here uh, torque as a function of current and flux and uh, speed as function of uh, current flux and voltage now if you combine those two equations together so if uh, from uh, from this formula uh, you uh, take IA and put that in the, this equation for torque uh, you will find out that uh, this actually is uh, an equation of a line so uh, then the torque speed characteristic for this kind of motor looks like this initially when you have zero torque uh, you have some constant speed and uh, then uh, here when you are increasing the load torque this, this component TL if you're loading the motor more uh, the speed is dropping so we have a decrease in speed and for a separately excited motor uh, there is a linear drop in speed now the parameter uh, that is uh, uh, 
uh, giving you the slope of this line is actually the armature resistance. So uh, if I just uh, complete uh, the chart now, then this uh, would be the parameter of uh, RA, uh, but actually it would go like this, and the RA uh, would be in this direction. So this is not like this, but uh, it's uh, going in this way. So if we are increasing the resistance here, uh, we get a sharper decrease of the speed. In other words, if you're loading the motor more with a larger RA, then the speed is dropping more and more. Uh, anyway, this drop between this initial speed, maybe we could call it omega zero, for example, and uh, the slope here, uh, it's uh, there is a drop, but it's not as significant as uh, for the second type of connection that we will see in a minute. But anyway, remember that this is a linear drop, and uh, there is a, this is not a very this delta omega is uh, not a very large value. So this is for the separately excited motor. We can see that this delta omega uh, is uh, smaller than the next case that we'll see. And we can say that uh, this type of connection, the separately excited motor, has uh, a hard torque speed characteristic. Hard means that if you're increasing the torque, there is a small drop of uh, this uh, speed that you have in the motor. So this is uh, suitable for applications where you want almost constant speed but uh, you want easy way of controlling the speed. So here the speed is controlled simply by changing the magnetic flux, uh, which can be done by variable resistor, for example. Now the second case, uh, well, this is, uh, this is ex actually explained all here. Uh, so uh, this explains our possibilities if we want to control the speed. So we can change the voltage from the power supply, we can change the armature resistance, we can change armature current, or we can change magnetic flux. Uh, but if we are changing uh, current, then there is a link between current and torque. So uh, if we are changing IA, uh, we will be actually changing the torque as well. So this is how you can actually control the speed uh, of a DC motor with all those four options. And we'll discuss that uh, next week, uh, how this is applied. Uh, let me go to uh, the serial motor. Now, if we uh, use the serial motor, uh, in the serial motor, all this is connected in series. So uh, we will have a different equation. And this equation is shown here. Uh, we will basically get that the torque is proportional to the second power of uh, current and speed is still dependent on uh, current and magnetic flux. Uh, now I will uh, continue with the serial motor next time. Uh, I would like to show you uh, a video now uh, about uh, how the DC motors are produced. So uh, uh, just give me uh, give me a second to actually find it, and uh, then I will uh, let you see the video. Uh, the video is uh, unfortunately in Czech only. It's an old video how those machines are manufactured. Uh, so I will just uh, mute the sound uh, and uh, I will uh, explain to you uh, how uh, this is. Uh, produced and we'll see the production of this uh, motor and uh, we'll see the uh, the manufacturing process of this DC motor. So let's uh, just give me a few seconds to find it actually and uh, I will see. So let's see. Okay, so uh, uh, one minute to find the 
correct video. seconds just to find it okay so uh, I will show you uh, the video not, not this one but the next one uh, this is uh, a video for the uh, production of uh, DC motors it's a uh, quite an old video but uh, we'll see the whole manufacturing process so now the uh, manufacturing process, uh, what, what we see now is uh, the shaft turning. So uh, uh, that was shafts and here uh, we can see this is electrical steel and uh, they use a press uh, to produce uh, the laminations. So now those are the rotor laminations. You can see how this is uh, looking like and how this is arranged. So uh, like this, uh, they align it on the, on the, sh the shaft, uh, they align the slots and they then they press all together so that it stays uh, in alignment. Uh, this is the commutator itself. And uh, now they will press the commutator on the shaft again uh, in, a, in the press. Uh, so it's a mechanical connection. Uh, so this is the rotor assembly uh, so far it is without the coils uh, we'll see the coils uh, in in a minute so this is uh, how uh, it is produced so uh, in this video they are mounting it manually but it can be done automatically uh, now uh, the, we see the connection of uh, the coils into the commutator so here that, that then it will be soldered later so now they submerge it into a bath of molten tin and lead tin and uh, it solders uh, the commutator to the wires and uh, it maintains the electrical connection. We see that uh, it's now almost a completed rotor. Uh, when they remove the solder then uh, it's uh, finished with the soldering and, uh, and they will just uh, clean it and uh, they will you see here and they will insulate the, the windings and fix it mechanically uh, now this is uh, insulation removal and uh, the next step will be the uh, insulation on the commutator sections so this is basically the whole rotor assembled Now the next steps, uh, what we will see, this is uh, turning of the commutator to make it uh, a cylinder. And uh, we'll see the turning. Uh, then uh, we will see the removing of the insulation. So now a um, special uh, cutter will cut through the copper sections and uh, this will insulate uh, the electrical sections of the commutator. So here we have the coils and uh, here uh, we have the individual uh, sections of the commutator and uh, this is uh, balancing of the rotor so uh, they will balance the rotor so that it's mechanically balanced and uh, eventually they will add or remove weight at uh, a given position uh, the weight is added like a piece of solder uh, that uh, will increase the weight at one position that has been determined during the balancing. And then they, they check it again on the balancing machine uh, to see if everything is balanced. Uh, now this will be the stator production. Uh, this is the uh, holder for the brushes. Uh, that is being turned. Uh, this is uh, the case for the brushes and uh, they will drill the holes, uh, they will make threads and so on and so on. So this is uh, mechanical production of the brush casings. Here we see turning. Uh, this is the pole piece of the 
DC motor. Again, it's a laminated steel, although here it could be uh, a single piece of steel. Uh, they press it together so that it's uh, one piece almost. And uh, the reason for the laminations here is simply it's easier to produce uh, than to have a cast iron, for example. Uh, now, this is the holder for the coil. Uh, this uh, white stuff is electrical insulation between the pole piece and uh, the copper wire. And uh, we'll now see the winding process uh, of the DC motor. So now they wind the, the field winding. So this is the completed field winding uh, and uh, we'll see the mechanical assembly. So they take this field winding, they mount it inside of the stator case. Uh, the number of poles uh, varies uh, based on the motor construction. So in this case, uh, they have uh, four uh, main poles and they have uh, the compensating poles as well. Now this is uh, the uh, brush assembly. So uh, this uh, will hold the brushes. The brushes in a DC motor are made from carbon uh, and uh, it's like a consumable material. Now this is the assembly of uh, the uh, two parts together and now what remains is uh, just to assemble the rotor and stator together. So we'll see how they install the rotor in the stator. Uh, they will put the B-rings on the shaft and uh, press uh, the B-rings uh, with some hydraulic jig on it. So this is the B-ring itself. Now they will press it, uh, well, hammering, obviously. And uh, now they are assembling together the machine. So this is the rotor uh, with uh, the case for the fan. And uh, then they will uh, mount it in uh, the stator and they will push uh, the other bearing on the other side and uh, uh, assemble all the machine together and uh, mount it with uh, with screws so it's a uh, it's a cooled uh, DC motor here in here in this position we see the fan that uh, blows the air around it and uh, this is testing uh, so every piece is typically tested uh, uh, if it uh, works properly.